Okay, take two. Uh, it's important to get these kind of technical faults uh, out of the way. I don't know if there'll be anybody watching now because that all went horribly wrong really quickly. <laughs> but anyway, it's all good, it's all good. In my experience, uh, it's always good just to get these things out of the way, do a little, you know, dress rehearsal, shall we say, tech run. Right, so Felix back in the room. I was just giving a bit of an intro there to Felix. So Felix, a friend of mine, I've known him for a few years now, runs the Fine Cider Company, um, supplying top London restaurants, uh, some beautiful ones. There he is. Can you hear uh, Sorry, I think it's working now. Yeah. Basically, good, I went in and everything went wrong, Felix. It was uh, not, not so good. How are you doing? No, I know. It's quite funny. I was going to make a joke about how many bloody crackers you gave me. Um, <laughs> but... That Listen, comic timing went out the window, didn't when, it? <laughs> when someone as uh, kind as Peter's Yard gives you a load of crackers, you've got to share the love. So um, there you go. There you are. Maybe that's what jinxed it. And yeah. you've, got, you, you've got your cheese and you've got your cider at the ready. I do, absolutely. So let's see if I can do this without tipping cheese all over my computer. But yeah, well done. There we have the wonderful, wonderful array. Fabulous. That's great. That's all from the cheese bar. Uh, so thank you for that, guys. Much appreciated. Um, so, yeah, I was just giving a little intro about who you are, uh, what the Fine Cider Company is. Um, and I don't know when that cut out, but basically saying that you sell, source and sell the very best ciders in the UK and from further afield to restaurants primarily. But obviously you're doing quite a lot of retail at the moment for obvious reasons. Um, you're also an author and uh, a sporter of an excellent Breton stripe. So, so I, have, I, have, I have this from an Instagram earlier, actually, so there we go. Well yeah. done, well done. I even changed for you. I did a, did a wardrobe change. So. Thank you. I'm much appreciated. I picked this T-shirt out especially. <laughs> right, let's stop flirting and have a talk about cheese and cider. Um, okay. So normally when, when I've bought cider from you, I've come to your place of work, brought some cheese, we've sat down and we've done a bit of a to and fro about, well, I think it works really well with this, or let's try it with this. Um, in fact, the first time I met you, we went and sat on your fire escape looking out over the uh, the gas holder out the back of your, your, your place and, and in the sunshine and had some glasses of cider and some lovely cheese. But this is a bit different. So... The closest we've got is a very distant handover of cheese and cider. So, I mean, I don't know. What are you expecting from from, from this evening? Uh, probably no less chaos than usual, I would imagine. Uh, <laughs> I mean, at least we had, we had the same wonderful weather. That's a nice bit of continuity. So it was obviously there beautiful sun the last time. I think it's we've done it more than once, actually, on the uh, tasting cheese and cider on the yeah, first yeah, day, yeah, probably. Yeah. So, but one thing I really love with this, and I think we've talked about this before, is that we haven't paired these as such preemptively. We've tried to use what experience as such we have to make some estimated guesses, but this is going to be a kind of live train of thought as to actually what we think works and doesn't. So hopefully for anyone who is wonderful enough to have bought uh, both the ciders and the cheeses and lucky enough as well, um, hopefully... In, in the massive sea of stuff being uh, done on Instagram and everything, this could actually then uh, have a kind of reality to it with cheese and, cheese and cider in front of people as well, so. Yeah, it, well, no, it, exactly. And I think, um, I mean, I've been banging on about the combination of cheese and cider for a while now, and more and more people are doing it, which is great, but I often come up against the idea that it's like, what, really? I mean, cheese and wine is so mm. kind of entrenched in our kind of consciousness that, everything else doesn't really get a look in. And actually, I don't know, I guess flavour-wise, cheese and cider, as we'll discover, is beautiful together. But also there's there's a kind of a narrative element to it as well, which I love. That kind of, I don't know, sense of romance, that, that, that idea of these products both kind of growing up together through history as kind of parallel farmhouse products. I mean, you know, we've talked about this before, the idea in you know, a farmhouse, in fact, wouldn't necessarily be sending their cider and their cheese to market say in the same way as we do now it would have been for the family and for the people who worked on the farm so they're kind of they've always coexisted i think and i think that for me anyway definitely feeds into the experience of of, of the flavor of the taste yeah it, exactly and you say the the correlation it's fascinating when you start to actually look what often goes on a cheese board there's often apple on a cheese board or chutneys there's fruit uh those kind of flavors uh, you already have to work with um 
and then, yeah, as far as pairing goes, you're talking the wonderful touches of acidity that cider can have that can work wonderfully with fat. Uh, the way that tannins can interact is, is uh, intriguing. And you say then the, the history, it, it partly uh, is just a creation of place, a bit like they say in wine, what grows together goes together. And yes, we have some wonderful winemaking in this country, but in far greater abundance, you've in far lesser known in its finest kind of echelons, we have incredible cider making. And uh, uh, partnering often in, in, in locality with amazing cheese making, such as the likes of Herefordshire, the many wonderful weight makers I work with there, and then the cheese making there, the likes of uh, Neil's Yard's Origin, all the other such things. So um, yeah, it is a fascinating one. As you say, the, the backdrop wasn't always as we assume now. I say that a lot with cider. Um, but yes, it, it goes back to the kind of truck acts of the late 1800s where people would be paid before that in things other than money. And that said that people had to be paid in money, which seems such a logical thing in a sense that you needed a point where it went from, OK, here's some stuff. Thanks for helping to, you know, and, and you've got all those interactions as well. You've got the best sizing teams, perhaps uh, in times of uh, the harvest, going to the places where the best cider. You can still legally today make 7000 litres of cider duty free in Britain. You have to apply for it, um, but it's uh, still very doable as a kind of hangover, for want of a better word, of that era. Um, and I think it's a thing that's all too often in the British kind of psyche bit underplayed or not explored enough. Mm. You know, for me, the insight was places like Herefordshire discovering this wonderful tradition and modern existence. And British cheese has been a real flag bearer of that. Um, well, and I that's what should probably yeah. say as well, that that's why we're here talking today really is this this sort of the wider picture of this particular conversation is it's part of the british cheese weekender so it's a bringing together by the academy of cheese specialist cheese makers association of lots of different cheese folk uh to basically celebrate that that heritage and history and, and these amazing products that are being made now and you know i took it as an opportunity to get to get you in the door felix and uh, get you into the, the world of cheese <laughs> Listen, well, let's say it's, we're doing a lot it's quite of selfish of us just to drink really nice cider and, and eat nice cheese and make people watch, but I'm more than happy to do it. Um, let's do it. And it yeah. Um, I'll just add as well that the one, mm. one, the real insight I got into cheese is I don't know that much at all about cheese in honesty, but um, a lot of it, yes, of course, has come from you. From it, For example, little moments like the wonderful Oliver's Cider wash rind uh, cheese. And I remember we went to Lyle's tasting that James Lowe there to kind of get an insight from another... Uh, another kind of individual, but the real, you know, in the, the build-up of knowledge on cider, things like wild yeast fermentations, the, the parameters and all of the variable forms, um, I had no idea that the same thing existed to the extent it does in cheese until I think it was um, uh, Bronwyn and Francis Percival's wonderful book, uh, Reinventing the Wheel, that I read for uh, in research kind of for my books because it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. And I just love, again, in, in people think of cider and they think of the kind of pint stuff uh, from a pub often. People think of cheese, perhaps, and often it's, you know, milk. And yet the variety that results, I do, from an outsider's perspective, um, have such a fascination and admiration for. So I can't wait to taste these ones. And then let's it. tell me all about the making as well. Let's, let's introduce the first cheese that we're trying this evening. It's rather glaring in the light there. So that's part of a driftwood. So driftwood is a beautiful goat's milk log from Somerset, sort of fresh citric flavour, a little bit of earthiness coming through from the rind, fantastic uh, texture, really smooth. Yeah, there we are, Felix, a pro there. On the nose first. It's nearly stuck it up my nose, that wouldn't be so professional. <laughs> We're just getting it in our uh, isolation <laughs> moustaches. I, I have done that at cider competitions every now and then. If you, get, if you have one too many drinks and you're really trying to get your nose in there and accidentally... Um, that's not so great, yeah. So, texturally, almost that's for me, that's one of the first things I notice is how incredibly smooth it is. Um, it's got a little bit of funk coming through just from under the rind. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested. So, tell us about the cider, what the, the one that we've kind of gone for here. So, the thinking with this obviously, we have three ciders and four cheeses. So, we've made our best placed uh, guesses as to what we really think will kind of harmonize based on things previously. I really love the ability that Perry can have to really beautifully kind of combine with the soft kind of uh, citrus size you can get on the, uh, 
on, on this kind of cheese and, and perry can have wonderful citric kind of acid elements as well um the olivers keeve perry so it's made with the process of keeving a uh, wonderful old technique effectively what it does is it retains some of the natural sugars from the pears so you get something that doesn't ferment to dry but any sweetness is naturally from the original fruit rather than anything added or introduced and it makes for a really wonderful sumptuous um uh wonderful sumptuous kind of result and form um you don't see too many keef perries it's a hard thing to do the uh the nature of the varieties, the the acid elements. Uh, Tom Oliver is one of the few people who, people who does it, and it's a glorious, sumptuous thing. So, going to pick up here. We've got Perry here from Cheese Plus More getting in on the funds early. Thank you, Perry. Uh, very much appreciated. So let's have a taste. Mm. I have to say, by the way, I love the look of this cheese as far as a kind of like exterior the, the shaping the colors of it it is glorious and then you see the texture is so smooth you get a bit of a viscosity coming through from the retained sugars in the the keeving yeah. and i think so you've kind of got a creaminess in the cheese and in a, in as much as you get within drinks a sort of creaminess through to the uh the perry i think as well that kind of that extra kind of syrupy sweetness works really well you you have got that because what you, if you can see i don't know if you can see just if i bring it really close you're just starting to get what's called a little bit of slippage under the rind. Now, that's just as it breaks down, the cream layer breaks down under the rind and you sometimes get a tiny little bitterness there. And actually, for me, that just really balances out the, the milk, the sweetness of the milk and it works really well. Mm. But actually that, that, that bitterness is just kind of really smoothed out by that perry. It's a really lovely kind of interplay. I don't know whether the perry's perhaps a little bit Almost, I mean, it's not a word I'd use with Perry normally, but quite robust mm. um, with that particular cheese. I think this is a good time. We've had this conversation quite a lot before as well, which is sort of what makes a good pairing, mm. and particularly with cider and cheese. And as you say, that's you, you sort of have memories of really wonderful pairings, and every time you put things together, you try and you know question if it if it matches up to that. I mean, of the three ciders we have as well, I'm slightly interested in a way uh, to try one of the other ones with this as well. Mm -hmm. But again, I think it's an interesting one to kind of discuss of what you consider, what I consider uh, actually makes for a really good pairing. What actually people should be kind of experiencing what you're hoping for. I mean, I suppose if you're going really traditional with, with that style of cheese, so let's, let's, you know, go to France, say, if you're looking at, say, mm. the classic lactic, uh, you know, Loire goat's cheese, so it's got a little bit more of a kind of crumble to the centre, but it's really fresh, citrus, hasn't quite got that creaminess of this, of this particular, but it, it's, yeah, it's kind of um, good acidity, all of that. You, you look traditionally to pair it with something like a Sancerre, so like that kind of crisp Dauvignon, or like a, a kind of more saline sort of pit pool would work really well as well. And actually, what was interesting about this is this is almost, I mean, it's not quite as syrupy and sweet, but it has got that kind of dessert element mm. to it. What are you trying it with there? So, I was just interested as well then to see how it, how it does alongside one of the other bottles we have, which is the um, Fine and Foster Oak, a wonderful new arrival for us. Uh, it's a champagne method cider, so people don't often expect ciders to have that kind of level of, uh, level of sparkle to them. So um, do when you pop it, chilled or expect it to be like a champagne effectively on opening. Um, it was a wild uh, or spontaneous kickoff to the fermentation in a steel tank and then it was moved into a uh, former Sharpham's rosé barrel. Um, so it had thyme in oak and a former rosé barrel. So that then combines with the secondary fermentation in bottle and the aging on lees and you start getting a hell of a lot of wonderful layers going on there and you'll notice on the front obviously when i hold this up this will be back to front maybe i should have bought a mirror and then i could have actually made this work but um <laughs> it has a uh, red olive drink 2020 uh to 2030 june so hopefully everyone's already who got one has already opened it and then afterwards wants to buy another one to uh to, to taste in a few years time yeah. so it goes again and uh uh, one element I mentioned a lot of people uh, don't always kind of engage with too much is the, the time element with cheese in terms of the process. With, with cider, the aging element is a really fascinating question and people like 
um, Polly and Matt, who make uh, uh, Find and Foster, uh, doing some really fascinating kind of things, working with time and, uh, and, and looking at the kind of effects that that does and confidently in that sense as well, knowing certain things like will age. As well, well is it, is it kind of raises another sort of important element to the whole pairing process is we talk a lot about flavour, um, but actually it's that, it's that textural quality as well. Mm. And, and, and this has got that kind of lovely kind of rolling foam. It's not kind of uh, so amazing colour, but what was it called? It's Find and Foster. Maybe you can just answer this at the bottom there, Felix. Find and Foster here. Oh, yes. So the fi yeah. Find and Foster uh, traditional method or method traditional oak. Yeah. So the traditional um, method is effectively the same as the champagne method. Uh, champagne method can only be applied to um, winemaking within the regions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but of course, it can be done in lots of other things. Uh, the origin of it even comes from uh, kind of 1600s invention in, in the UK of Ver what became known as Veron Glaze bottle glass. So uh, Cider and Perry has been doing this for a long so time. So we invented the champagne bottle, that's right? Yeah, ve if effectively. I, I mean, it's... You know, these things go like down a long time, a 60 or 70 year period, members of the Royal Society were very involved in it. Okay. Um, yeah, the title in, in parts of Germany, such glass is still called English glass. Um, but there's a description, the earliest description, I think, involves a uh, uh, presentation of uh, either adding a walnut of sugar to make a drink fret and sparkle, or uh, there's, there's an irony that there's an early description as well, describing it as a means to remedy a bad wine. Um, so, and it all happened before the Dom Perignon, uh, you know, I mean, he didn't have anything to do with champagne, um, nothing at all, effectively. There's even a statue of Dom Perignon outside Moet, a Chandon, who don't have anything to do with Dom Perignon. Um, and it's a figment of an artist's imagination, because he died before photography was invented and there were no surviving drawings or paintings. Fantastic. So, so it's marketing, marketing, marketing still. Yeah, so the, 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 the lineage, effectively, is what I'm saying of, such champagne method or traditional method ciders is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. You go back to the uh, 1600s, 1700s, you have uh, cider flutes, a wonderful museum in Herefordshire with tons of these uh, lead glass, uh, diamond etched engraved uh, uh, flutes. There's a, one of the most famous ones um, uh, in, uh, in the Museum of London here, in fact. So um, as it goes, yes. So Felix, I want to move on to the next cheese because actually I think, although we didn't try it, let's quickly try that driftwood with the third cider that we've not actually yep. mentioned yet, the wilding. I didn't put out a spittoon, so I'm just going to have to... <laughs> You're just going to have to. It's Saturday, mm. fine. I, I, do like, I do like the question, and I think this highlights it fairly well, is what are you actually kind of looking for in a pairing? Going back to that one, and it is that thing of how does one thing affect the other? I always think there's almost three categories of pairing. Maybe there's a fourth one where just nothing happens, but one, uh, one thing can kind of overpower and affect the other. You know, one thing can be lifted and the other one tastes not, not better as a result. You can get vice versa as well. You can obviously get a little stodgy middle ground where they're just all right. But when they both actually seem somehow enhanced is where it always so, seems to have magic for me. So as part of the Academy of Cheese, we talk about it in terms of uh, friends, enemies and lovers. <laughs> so, uh, friends will who knew cheese was so romantic uh, yeah. so friends uh, they sit on the palate sort of fairly happily next to one another but they don't really you know sparks don't fly uh, mm. enemies you, you know you're having say I don't know like a, a really robust stout porter say with this driftwood would be enemies I mean it would just steamroll one over the other and then lovers is exactly that you're kind of elevating you know these already delicious products just to another level really that and i think that's what i'm looking for is that next level that mm. next level of, of combined flavor is actually more tantalizing somehow than than the individuals yeah. on their own um so that's yeah I'm and for me it, it it brings out largely then the best the thing that you already like in that cheese for example the creaminess some of those other factors mm. that might stand out more clearly um, and also i love the the sort of you know, when you, you take a bite and then you have a sip, the, the change in the taste in your mouth, when that's a long change and it's fascinating, that's where I find it really intriguing. And I have to say, I think actually, you say the third bottle, Wilding, a wonderful Somerset maker. Uh, they're Stoke Red, so it's a single variety Stoke Red. Uh, really wonderful cider apple. It came to prominence in the kind of 1920s or so. 
uh, around uh, Rodney Stoke in Somerset. So that's where the name comes from. And luckily they dropped the Rodney bit and just went with the Stoke bit. Um, but it's a really sumptuous, glorious variety when it's, when it's got a sweetness like this. I think it makes one of the best ciders on the sweeter end of the spectrum. It's got such a glorious kind of uh, shape to it. And I do think actually that really pulls out some of the creaminess in the cheese in a really gorgeous way. I kind of have that pairing as my favorite. I'm that that kind of, yeah. What I'm enjoying about this, uh, Felix, is I often deal in quite kind of uh, um, a abstract uh, poetical terms, and you you are kind of clinical, and I'm in, I'm enjoying that. For me, there's an element of kind of uh, apple crumble and custard going on on the palate. Mm. Those two things in your mouth. Do you know what I mean? You've got that that creamy sensation on the palate, but you've also got a real kind of fruit, almost a little bit of, I don't know, cinnamon spice and definitely that biscuitiness coming through. I, I think I like it. I think it pulls out a bit more of the acidity in the cider. I almost get a bit more of the rhubarb -y kind of note, the acid. Mm. Yeah, and rhubarb. And I think then come across, you know, in a really nice way. I feel like rather than just accentuating the kind of, sweetness in the cider actually it pulls out a bit more of the like chunkier more interesting mm. stuff and i like as you say on that i i tend to be pretty esoteric i think but i did do a an art degree before and i had a wonderful course leader who spoke in football analogies which was the best <laughs> leveler when you've got all these people being kind of high fluting in art terms yeah. uh so yeah uh, <laughs> maybe some of that wore off yeah That's all good. right should we move to the um, cheese let's move to the cheddar so just to introduce it, this is a quick mature cheddar, so 12 months plus, um, and they live, they are in fact just up the road from these guys, um, good friends in fact. Uh, mm. So the Quicks family have been farming that bit of the world for a, a 500 years or so, um, and this is sort of, I guess, one of, one of the largest producers of cloth-bound cheddar, certainly in the UK. Um, but yeah, this is just a real classic cheddar. I would say... It's probably on the kind of sweeter, more acidic end of the spectrum, whereas, say, a Montgomery's cheddar is like super bassy, kind of meaty end. Um, mm. always, still quite a nice fruity, fruity side to this. There is yeah, another, it gives me a reminiscence past, of the pasture and kind of, I always put it, think horseradish. Like, mm. for me, it's, mm. it's big on the horseradish. It's a really interesting thing, that. And once but, that's But then it comes that, through really, really creamy in the mouth, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Mm. I like you mentioned the um the cloth side. I'm not I'm not overly sure actually the, the the crossover. I believe it might just be a terminology thing. But a lot of makers, well, small makers still today, will be pressing, uh, pressing their fruit in a historical way. Uh, unless you go, unless you were working with straw, is something called a cheesecloth. Uh, the makers, uh, an apple, of course, is very strong. Actually, it's not like a grape. You can't just press it with your feet. So what people have to do is grind the apples up first, break them up, so that they can then press uh, that broken up uh, uh, pomace. And what uh, often is, is done and has been the way so often is these enormous layers, almost like a big ziggurat, mm. of all of this kind of crushed up ground up apple wrapped in cloths that are called cheesecloths. So I, th I, say, I think it comes from just a, a terminology of a cheesecloth being something you wrap. I, I would imagine uh, it's exactly the yeah. same product. I mean, it's a really fine yeah. mesh muslin, effectively. So I, I you mm. know, but there again, they, you know, they sit side by side. I think that, you know, there's no coincidence there for sure. Um, no. I was contacted by Polly, um, who was trying some of Quick's cheeses and we've got their kind of, I guess their, you know, their marquee cheese like here. It's the absolute, mm. that's their big one. But they also do quite a few different other products as well. Um, and the one that she picked actually out for this particular site was they do a um, an elderflower elderflower cheese. So they actually mm. come through the curds and, and make the cheddar that way. It's quite sweet mm. um, and, and distinctly floral, obviously. But but yeah, she was like, yeah, that's the pairing and the goat cheddar as well. She was quite keen on. Um, you're buffering there, Felix. There he is. She's back. Oh, back in the room. Give me one second. Well, I've got someone here. <laughs> Kath Potter. Cheddar and the Stoke Red is yep. amazing. So maybe we should try that. I'm going to try it and have a little look out of Felix's window. Mm. I uh, I spotted uh, what Kath said as well, and Kath knows her stuff of cheese mm. cider as well. Um, mm. So some wonderful pairing herself. So I decided that I probably should actually, rather than just necking everything. Um, get something because uh, as a little spittoon. So I do, I do like one thing. 
what did you get with the Fine and Foster Oak on that? Because I, I found it changed the profile of the the cheddar to being slightly more reminiscent to me of Gouda in a way, and a little, you know, and a little touch. It was less the creaminess, and it was more a kind of like um, the 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 kind of uh, it, uneven elements in the uh, texture came through a bit more. Yeah. I mean, I think. I think it draws the oak out for me. Like, I think you get that quite significantly more with the cheddar. But mm. bouncing off each other there. I think, I think that's one that all, I also get a little bit of that kind of back note of, a, of sort of, um, not bilious, but that acidity with, with, with the cheese, which doesn't kind of... Mm. It's really interesting because they're both fantastic products on their own. But just putting them together does not guarantee you know, deliciousness. You've, you've got this slight kind of mismatch, but, but I've just tried the, the Stoke Res and, and that as a pairing, you've got that lovely, you've got that real kind of, yeah, again, that sort of toffee sweetness, which, which picks mm -hmm. up sweet notes in the cheddar, but that, that kind of um, saltiness inevitably in cheese, mm -hmm. off the fruitiness, I think that that's really nice. Brings out some of the pastry even mm -hmm. in the cheddar. The sweet and sour. I mean, I again, this I guess this is one thing that ultimately as well, when you get really into it with tastings, you do come down to these things where sometimes you get two versions mm. and taste comes into it. Because I, I actually prefer what happens to the Stoke Red from the first cheese rather than mm -hmm. the second. So from the drift or the driftwood, I actually find I lose the tail of the Stoke Red a bit against the cheddar, and the cheddar is so. When it breaks up in your mouth, the thickness, the creaminess sticks in your mouth it's in a lot of ways. You've got all that, that milk fat coating yeah. inside your mouth. You need something with a bit of, I don't know, a bit of tannin, really, maybe. Something mm. with a bit more kind of crunch to it to really strip that away and, and, and push through. But Yeah, that's right. I'm Do you like the bottle for that? that so the, yeah, the bubbles, the texture, cleaning that mm. through. I, say, mm. I find it slightly drops the tail. But partly maybe it's just personal taste. I like, and I'm very accustomed to some of the kind of heartier side of uh, ciders. And I like that it pulls a bit more of that out, the driftwood with the Stoke Red. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, All right. At the clock, and we should move on to the next one because uh, everybody else, anybody who's sort of following closely this amazing thing that is British, uh, British Cheese Weekender, know that at nine o'clock, uh, James Golding from the Pig Hotel Group is cooking Tartiflex with, in fact, the same cheese that we're about to taste. So, Julian mm. Sedley from the Old Cheese Room makes a delicious washed rind, uh, so brine washed, uh, so no cider in this wash. Jersey cow's milk, so I don't know if you can see there, I'm going to bring it a bit closer. You've got that lovely kind of buttery yellow paste, that's the Jersey cow, so it, it really... And a real kind of aromatic, sort of pungent oh, aroma wow. on, on, on the nose, but super creamy and buttery. Let's have a little taste of the cheese. I don't I imagine Juliana's setting up for her tasting, but I think the brine she uses is actually quite is sort of higher salt than, than some others that I know, you know, how they do. Um you've got a little bit of crunch in the rind, a little bit of kind of smoky bacon almost. Which again leads us on to another thing, which is that one. <coughs> Thing of pork and cider. Mm. Um, mm. I like uh, if you want to go uh, deep on the pork and cider. I, I kind of want to follow old reference in a book on Google Books or something. I can't remember exactly where it was. Someone, someone else might know. Uh, it's a description. It might have been John Beale. Maybe I'm not sure, but um, uh, centuries ago, talking about Herefordshire pork being the best mm. in the country because they were fed on apple pod. Mm -hmm. Not affecting the taste, so um, I love again where these things cross over in, in, in fascinating ways. You know, like the mm -hmm. kind of the Birko ham of the uh, the bacon world. <laughs> okay, perhaps um, that I have to say that is one of the most fascinating kind of unctuously creamy cheeses I think I've ever had. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, it's based on a Reblochon, so Reblochon style. Mm -hmm. which is why they're making tartiflette with it. Um, over on another Instagram, I suspect. But um, yeah, really, really delicious, smooth, creamy. But again, you've got that salty, almost crunch, meaty, uh, you know, deeply, deeply savoury in the rind there. Yeah, the rind, really, that texture and the sort of like slight squidge to it in the mouth is mm. really nice. So originally, we thought this might do the Stoke Red, but I got a feeling that doesn't quite cut it with this creaminess. 
Mm. I think you need something to kind of cut through it a bit. So, we're looking probably at the final foster oak. Yeah. I will be interested, Perry often is seen as the more delicate side of things, but I will be interested to see how that goes against this as well in a funny way. Um, it could be a wild card, Perry, in, in the best of senses. So I've got Tom Chatfield here. Any farty ciders coming up, Sam? No, Tom. No, there aren't. Tom, Tom introduced me to a bottle of cider. I can't remember the name of it, Tom. You might be able to remind me. But um, you open it and it is immediately, as an ex-French colleague of mine uh, would describe, Zikau's us. So uh, uh, <laughs> very specific. Uh, I've come across a cheese or two where you open the fridge and you think you've gone into the bathroom, but... Yeah. <laughs> So how are we going to try it? Should we try this with the Fine and Foster? Yeah, I'm already on to the Perry. Sorry, I'm... Uh, no, no, you've moved on. That's fine. I love this. This cheese is fascinating. Mm. Oh. Mm, okay. What do you think of the Fine and Foster with the oak, the method traditional? Mm. I think so for me yeah. I think it I think it just brings out that slightly ammonic bitterness. Yeah, there's a bitter there's a bitter thing at the crossover between the two, but isn't there? It doesn't quite yeah. definitely there. Yeah. For me, I think the perry actually yeah. works really well. I, always, I agree. Like, the word that always comes to me with perry is that perfume. It's definitely a yeah. kind of perfume aromat kind of thing going on. And definitely that's true of you know, with the bacteria, bacterial action going on here, it's all that, those sort of lovely, pungent, ar aromatic, you know, those kind of words spring to mind. So I think those two are playing with each other quite nicely. It's that category of, it's that category of pairing where they're two kind of kindred spirits in a sense. It's a really mm. bloody rich pairing. You can mm. only have so much, but as a, a d dessert pairing or such like, it's, mm. it's wonderful. Mm. Um, we say that there's a viscosity and the, there's the rich and sweetness to the key side of stuff, that beautiful kind of floral um, fruit side, and then with this, the creaminess. It's sort of, you know, an end of the spectrum of cheese and of, of perry in a sense that's kind of rich and unctuous, but they kind of, bubble, yeah. you know, kindred. And they can handle one another texturally, that, you know, it's almost like we were mm -hmm. looking for those bubbles in the initial pairing with the fine and foster, but actually that kind of syrupy note that they're, yeah. They can handle one another. I quite like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's move All righty. On. Oh, that is beautiful. It really is. So this love is a good Devon. blue. Mm. So Devon blue. It's actually on the kind of delicate side, I would say, of blues. There's a bit of spice going on there. But it's um, beautifully smooth, really well balanced. From Ticklemore Dairy down, uh, down, in, uh, down in Devon, Ben Harris makes it. Smells so kind of... Creamy, I'm getting a little hint of like the clotted cream side in there. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. This was actually the one that when we were chatting about what we were going to try, I thought would work really well with the Perry. Mm. Okay. You want to, I'm going to pour something off to the side here and we'll see how it goes with this. What have you got there? He's got Ribena. Mm. I mean, I think. Uh, so, what are you drinking there, Peter? What, what extra? Is there? Not in. No, I put I put that with the Pine and Foster to see because it's so mm. creamy and soft. I don't mind what it does to the cider, but I don't think it brings out the best in the cheese. How's the perry on that one? Good. I mean, I have to say, I would probably like something with a little little extra sweetness. Um, you know, maybe, I know you use uh, you sell a really lovely brand, is it Brandland? Oh, uh, yeah, the ice maybe. cider. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what ice cider is, because that's a fascinating area. Absolutely, yeah, and... Uh... Yeah, the uh, the acidity side and the sweetness on Brandland's ice cider can work work in one place. So, 
I say the, the best way to think of it, I suppose, is kind of like a dessert wine. Um, that's the category you'd put it in. The, the levels of sweetness, um, <clears throat> the kind of nature of making, therefore the cost of the liquid, the house, the kind of volume that you'd actually look to drink of it. And uh, it's made in a similar way to ice wine. Uh, what, it, what it does is use ice, as the name suggests, um, in the process. So uh, different things will freeze at different levels. Water freezes at zero degrees. Sugar freezes slightly below that. Pure alcohol, ethanol, I think, freezes at something ridiculous like minus 127 or something. Um, you're not actually working on it on the alcohol stage with this. But if you uh, imagine you took a container of apple juice and you froze it, so the whole thing is frozen to ice, and then you let it uh, start thawing, the first stuff to melt would be the sugar, other such components. The water would be bound up in ice. So effectively, it's a means of concentrating. Uh, but without it being the kind of massive machinery, um, you know, not quite the same thing as the mass market definition of cider, which says something only has to be 35% apple juice and can be from concentrate uh, from, you know, big, uh, big silver tanks and machinery uh, churning this stuff out. Um, uh, what you get as a result can be a wonderfully, incredibly kind of rich, focused version of a lot of the properties of apples. You don't tend to make ice cider um, for, for good reason with traditional cider, cider apples that are, say, high in tannins, high in, uh, in acidity and such like, uh, because you're concentrating. If something's very tannic and you make an ice cider from it and you're only using, say, 20% of the must, so the first 20% thawed from such a freezing process, um, it would blow your head off with tannins. Mm. So it tends to, you're working with, a subtler kind of fact. It's a bit like distilling, whereby if there's any fault at the start, it'll be amplified in the process. Mm. Um, the other means that you can do it by to an extent and uh, being uh, where Brandland is, which is on the Baltic seaboard in Sweden, at a uh, latitude kind of on par with uh, Iceland and Greenland, only about 160 miles south of the Arctic Circle. One of the most northerly orchards in the world and they've got an amazing uh, planting project uh, that's been kicking off this year. I think it's 12,000 trees they're planting up, up there. And we're talking conditions that get as low as minus 26 degrees Celsius in winter, that kind of level. Um, fruit on trees in that, those conditions, the cold and the wind dehydrates them, gives a concentrating factor as well. And they work with wonderful old Russian, uh, Swedish, Finnish varieties. Um, it's incredibly unique what they do. And the nature of these Ice ciders are like some of the most exquisite, exquisite dessert wines you have. And a big part of that is they get a wonderful level of acidity, not just sweetness. Mm. Um, I mean, we were doing uh, kind of 60 bottles a week to the Fat Duck before, uh, before Christmas. We had a new release that actually we previewed at my book launch. The wonderful uh, Tate Britain hosted it very kindly. And it was a wild yeast only fermented ice cider, which is very rare because the fructose levels make it a very hostile environment for such uh, activity um, that they uh, fermented aged in a single uh, 114 litre new Austrian oak barrel for 36 months, so three years. Um, there's barely any of it. I've got a, a friend that go wrong. No, I mean, this is the joy. Andreas, the maker there, is incredible at doing these sort of experimentations to see. And it's the most remarkable liquid. You know, the, you know the scene in Ratatouille, the film, the wonderful animated film? where the, uh, the kind of grouchy kind of uh, villainous uh, reviewer at the end is served Ratatouille. And it like takes him back to being a little kid. I got a moment when I tasted this that was remembering my dad baking dessert apples, having cored them and putting uh, brown sugar and raisins and butter in there right. and having put them in the oven for ages. And I was, you know, it's like that in a little burst. And a bit like some of these cheeses, it will, it's got a real viscosity. It will hide in amongst your teeth. So much of it exists on the aftertaste anyway, but you'll kind of discover it with your tongue as it goes along. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really uh, uh, incredible and fascinating thing. Mm. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think maybe next time we'll go for that kind of style, try that sort of style with something blue, because I think if you've got anything like that, or you can get hold of anything like that for anyone watching, mm. try it with the blue cheese, because that, in any, I have to say, in any kind of tasting, be it with cider, beer, wine, 
uh, if that's the taste that people go away with because it's so deeply satisfying that, that mm. you know salt and sweet I mean I will I'm doing three tastings and I will say salt and sweet over and over again there's obviously loads of different layers of levels of nuance but fundamentally we are you know our little rat brains are getting excited about the presence of salt and sweet and if they're well balanced together fantastic that's really mm. look felix i'm going to let you go because i think people are emigrating over to number two pound street part of uh cook off which is fair enough yeah um, let's do that i'm going to stuff my face with cheese great I, i've got quite a lot of cider to drink um that's fine <laughs> i'll survive um, right. it's yeah. lovely to see you and, and thank you so much for taking part and um, we'll catch Welcome. up thank you cheers, cheers. Bye -bye. cheers Sam. Bye -bye.